Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Norway and Denmark had staked their survival upon the strictest interpretation of neutrality to escape the war. Their sympathies were with the Allies, but they took extraordinary precautions to avoid offending Hitler. So, on April 9th, Hitler invaded Denmark and Norway. Denmark was powerless to resist, and didn't. Norway was stunned by an avalanche of force and treachery. Fifth columnists, led by Major Quisling, a Norwegian traitor, spread panic and confusion. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. This week, our time machine visits the dark days of World War II in a particularly dark corner of that war. Our guest is Timothy J. Boyce, and he's the editor of From Day to Day, One Man's Diary of Survival in Nazi Concentration Camps. The one man in the title is Odd Nansen. Listeners outside Scandinavia may never have heard of him, but Norwegians recognize him as one of their distinguished statesmen. Architect, author, humanitarian, Odd Nansen joined the resistance as Norway fell under the Nazi jackboot. As a friend of the royal family, the Gestapo snatched Odd as a hostage in an effort to keep Patriot forces in check and send a message to the Norwegian government in exile. Odd Nansen's pedigree landed him in a succession of concentration camps, where he chronicled his experiences and the crimes he witnessed in secret at the risk of his own life. If you heard my interview with Neil Bascom, author of The Winter Fortress, the epic mission to sabotage Hitler's atomic bomb, you know that one of my oldest and dearest friends lives in Norway, and that the nation holds a special place in my heart through his Norwegian family especially as it relates to their valiant fight against their occupiers in the war. Tim is an attorney and an author, and holds an MBA from the Wharton School of Finance, a JD from the University of Pennsylvania Law School, and a BS in Foreign Service from Georgetown University. You can visit him online at timboyce.com. And that last name is spelled B-O-Y-C-E. Okay. Now that we've caught the first whispers about this Norwegian legend, let's descend into the hellish world of concentration camps during the Second World War, where the condemned abandoned all hope of the future and could only live their lives from day to day. I'm joined on the line by Tim Boyce, editor of from day to day, one man's diary of survival in Nazi concentration camps. Thank you for making time to talk with the History Author Show. Well, thank you, Dean. I really appreciate it. I'm very passionate about your book. It was an amazing find. I was so happy that you tracked me down to send it to me. People probably think when they read about a diary that it's from the war, so they think of the diary of Anne Frank. It's written by another enemy of the Nazi state, but Mm -hmm. one trapped outside a camp, not inside. And part of what's so riveting about Anne Frank's story is we could kind of identify with being stuck in that attic. We can identify with hiding and the risk of it. Odd Nansen is already captured here. He's inside a prison already, and he's writing to us. So how do their two experiences compare when you put them side by side? Well, there's definitely many similarities and many, many differences. Obviously, the first one being that Anne Frank was a 13-year-old girl when she went into hiding, and uh, Nansen was a 42-year-old man with a family when he was arrested. Interestingly, there are quite a few diaries of people who were in hiding at various times during the war. Based on my research, there are very, very few diaries written inside of a concentration camp for reasons which I think you can well imagine. 
just how difficult it would be to both write it and then hide it and then somehow smuggle it out of the camp. So nonsense is truly one of the uh, unique pieces of literature to come out of the war based on my research, which is not exhaustive, but I think there's probably no more than two dozen to three dozen diaries written inside of a concentration camp that at least have survived. And of those, only about five or so have ever been translated into English. So if you wanted to read the entire oeuvre of literature on concentration camp diaries, it'd be a pretty short list. So nonsense, I think, is very important on that sense. Getting back to the comparison with Anne and Odd Nonsen, what is kind of interesting is in some ways, at least initially, Odd Nonsen was more free than Anne was. When she went into hiding, she entered those rooms and she never left them. She could never go out. Whereas, as you know from the diary, at least initially when Nonsen was arrested, he was allowed sometimes to actually walk into town to get supplies unaccompanied by even a guard. Um, I think the Germans knew well that he couldn't escape and they knew where his family lived, so he had all the reasons in the world to come back. He even mentions one time that maybe I should just walk away, but there was always the warning that had been announced in all of these camps that if somebody escaped, then the Germans would take their revenge on 10 prisoners who were still inside the the camp and execute them. So that was also a, a compelling reason. But interesting that in some ways, Nansen as a prisoner had more freedom, at least initially, than Anne did. I think in thinking about it a little bit, to me, the, the biggest difference between their two diaries is that Anne's, I think, is more personal. It's more introspective. It's dealing more with the issues of growing up, becoming a woman, getting along with both her family and with a bunch of strangers in a very, very cramped, crowded situation. She's somewhat removed from the the horrors of the war itself, whereas Nansen is not only witnessing the brutality in these camps being meted against other prisoners, but sometimes he's the subject of them. He, he was for a while in the penal gang. He spent some time in solitary confinement. He was subject to punishment drills, one time I think for turning around and talking to somebody in the uh, roll call line when he was supposed to be doing it. So I think that adds a layer to his record of survival that that is different and in addition to what Anne went through. But But still, they're both very personal and they're really confiding with complete honesty their innermost thoughts to these pages of what was really going on. That honesty is something that's an important feature of it. When you get somebody who can write completely unselfconsciously, it's what makes an actor great, too, is that they can Mm -hmm. take on that role. They can be in front of a camera and a million people, and they can, you know, Tom Hanks can pretend to be alone on that island in Castaway. I I don't know why (laughs) that's what pops into my head, maybe because of the isolation and just the loss of hope and the suffering. I didn't want to give people the impression from saying he was allowed some liberties early on that being in this camp is a white collar prison kind of experience. He witnesses and it gets progressively darker, forced labor, cruelty, executions on a whim, things like you described just now, turning around and talking and then, you know, suffering this random punishment, just completely out of proportion of everything as the, maybe as the German frustration grows too, you can see that with him. And he's kind of a reminder of that. And we say prisoner, he's in there with the prisoners, but he's almost a hostage, isn't he? He's almost being held as one of these people that will be executed if the Norwegian government in exile acts up or somebody attacks, like when they attack the heavy water plant. Exactly. So that's constant stress on him. No question. No question at all. And if there is any narrative arc to be seen through this diary, it's just how the conditions continually get darker and worse and worse and worse. So, yeah, to focus on the fact that he had some freedom initially, this was in the first months of his incarceration. He was a prisoner for almost 40 months, and the punishment just got worse and worse. The treatment got worse. And then it became a quantum level more difficult and and more intense when he has moved in the summer of 1943 from a camp in Norway to a concentration camp in Germany. In fact, the commandant in the Norwegian camp called Gdini summons Nansen and says to him, you might as well tell your family to put up a headstone for you right now because you're never coming back. Of course, Nansen did survive, but it was a close-run thing, and I think especially psychologically, I think he was 
suffering by the time spring 1945 comes around. At this point, he's he thought the war was going to end in 42, and then in 43, and then in 44, and here it is, 1945, and the war still hasn't ended, and the suffering has just gotten exponentially worse all the time. So I think he's really at the end of his rope, and luckily for us and for him, the, the war did end in the spring, and he was able to be evacuated out. Let's back up to the very beginning. Take us to that moment Odd Nonsen is up in a cabin. It's Christmas vacation, if you could set it any more tragically perfect. Yeah. He's in the mountains above Lillehammer. He's just enjoying all the things you enjoy in a Norwegian Christmas. And there's a knock on the door. And at this point, I think maybe that's not as ominous as you might think later. Certainly not as ominous as it would have been for Anne Frank. But that's the last freedom he sees for those three and a half years. Mm -hmm. Why do they take him prisoner? Why do they make him sort of this hostage, as I described? Who is he? What's his background? What makes him more valuable to the Germans as a prisoner than just another corpse, frankly? Right, right. Well, the date is January 13th, 1942. As you mentioned, he's in Lillehammer on an extended holiday. He is spending time in the cabin with his family. It's a cabin owned by his business partner. In Norway, these cabins up in the woods called Hutta are um, something that every Norwegian loves to spend as much free time as they can. And it just so happens that the gentlemen who are approaching the cabin are arriving at 7.30 p.m. on the night of January 13th. 7.30 p.m. happened to be, just coincidentally, the time when the BBC would broadcast its Norwegian news. And, of course, the Nansen family was tuning into the radio to listen to the Norwegian BBC broadcast and they see these people approaching and they're thinking initially, well, they must be here because of this radio. It turns out just listening to the BBC was actually breaking two very serious laws that the German occupation authorities had decreed. The first one was all the residents of Norway were supposed to turn in all of the radios. Only people who belonged to the fascist NS party were allowed to keep their radios. So just having a radio in your in your cabin or in your home was a crime. Second, listening to the BBC was a crime. So here they are breaking two laws by, by virtue of their sitting around the radio in their living room about to listen to this. There's a knock on the door. They managed to hide the radio uh, before they opened the door. They had already worked out kind of a plan where everybody would be. They're trying to act nonchalant, and these gentlemen walk in and say, to Nansen, well, you're, you're wanted for questioning. Not that you're under arrest, nothing beyond. You have to come back into town, ultimately into Oslo for questioning. Nansen had once before been brought in by the Gestapo, about a year before that, for questioning and released. So I'm sure in his mind, he thought, since they're not charging me, I haven't done anything particularly wrong that I've been caught, probably be questioned and be released in a day or so. And as you mentioned, he never saw his freedom again in fact, this was part of a roundup that was coordinated by the Norwegians and by the Germans. The Reichskommissar, a gentleman named Joseph Terboven, was behind this roundup of 20 of the most prominent Norwegians in the country who all had some personal tie with the royal family. What had happened was in late December of 1941, the British had launched a commando raid against the coastline of Norway. They landed, they blew up a couple of factories, they shot and killed a number of German soldiers, captured some others as POWs, they also arrested a number of Norwegian fascists, put them all on their ships and absconded, went back to England. And Terboven, who was the kind of civilian overlord of Norway on behalf of Hitler, couldn't launch a corresponding raid but he thought, well, the next best thing I can do is try to get back at the royal family by rounding up very prominent citizens. And as you say, not charging them with any crime, just saying you're a hostage now and almost daring the British to do something again to incite or allow them or give them a reason for punishing these people. A second reason that I think Nansen not only was arrested, but then spent the rest of the war in jail when, interestingly, the other 19 prisoners who were rounded up in this late January roundup all were released at some point during the course of the war was that Nansen was a bitter personal enemy of the head of the fascist party and the fascist government in Norway, a gentleman by the name of Viking Quisling, 
from which we get the word now quisling, the noun meaning treachery or treason. It turns out that Viscount Quisling, as a young man, had actually done some humanitarian work as an aide to Odd Nansen's father, a gentleman named by the name of Fritjof Nansen, very famous Norwegian, if not the most famous Norwegian Norway has ever produced. He was a polar explorer, a statesman, and also a humanitarian, ended up uh, being awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1922 for his work, including some work he did in Russia in the early 1920s to help with some famine relief. And that's where Quisling had been one of his assistants. When Quisling formed his fascist party in 1933, shortly after Hitler seized power in Germany, he would often give speeches that would say go something along these lines. I, Viking Quisling, was a very close friend and working compatriot with the famous Fritjof Nansen, who incidentally was now dead. He had died in 1930, so he couldn't comment on this. And then Quisling would go on, I know Fritjof Nansen, we talked, and I know if he were alive today, he would be supporting my fascist program, which of course he never would have been at all sympathetic with fascism. Uh, he had condemned both communism and fascism in some of his writings. Interestingly, Quisling's party, when they published some of his writings, edited out all the references to fascism and just left in the reference to communism. So Nansen, Odd Nansen, was infuriated by this kind of behavior, and he would often go to these speeches and try to interrupt Quisling and say, you're lying, that's not what my father would have stood for. He had a personal interview with Quisling shortly after the Germans invaded the country in April of 1940 and said, I've got to tell you as a matter of conscience, and uh, I know you probably won't do anything about it, but you know you're lying. I know you're lying. You know my father would never agree to any of your program. And I think that just made a personal enemy out of Quisling. And then once the Germans invaded Norway, they installed in 1942 Quisling as kind of the head of the puppet government. So he had a great deal of say over uh, the administration of the prisoners in the country, and I think he kind of kept his thumb on the scale and made sure that Odd Nansen, who he had a personal grudge against, was never released for the course of the war, which, as I mentioned before, of the 20 hostages that were rounded up in January of 1942, he was the only one who never saw freedom for the entire course of the war. There's also a really exciting story about how the royal family escapes. And I just want to say, if people visit Norway, you're sailing up the Oslo Fjord, which you should do. You can see a little bit of World War II history there that's very subtle, just that island where they have the torpedo tubes. And that plays a role, this sort of daring decision on the spot. These ships are coming. Do Are they German ships? Are they enemies? Are they friends? Mm -hmm. And firing on them is one of the things that gives the royal family a chance to escape and establish this government in exile. I always find it fun to connect the dots there and get a full picture of history. And, you know, you think of that happening when you're there, having your cocktails now in a nice, free, prosperous mm -hmm. Norway. And mm -hmm. then I read your book and I say, well, this is one of the effects of that is a man like Odd Nansen gets grabbed and because they're trying to pressure the royal family and spends three and a half years in prison, then fast forward to you and you describe it as total serendipity that you even found out about his story. You pick up a book titled A Lucky Child by <laughs> Thomas Bergenthal, mm -hmm. and he actually wrote the preface here for From Day to Day. Yep. So tell us, how does that moment of serendipity, picking up a lucky child, pique your interest for looking into this lost diary? Okay. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, well, it all goes back to early 2010, when I wandered into a bookstore looking for a book to read, and I probably, like you, read mostly history. I find it immensely fascinating. And I particularly enjoy reading memoirs because I like to read what happens to real live people and find out what they go through. I had some fascination with the Holocaust. I had, of course, long since read The Diary of Anne Frank and Primo Levi and Elie Wiesel and people like that. And so this book called The Lucky Child, which has a picture of this young boy on the cover, young Tom Bergenthal, has a subheading, Surviving the Holocaust as a Young Child. So on really nothing more than an impulse, I bought the book and learned the amazing story of Tom Bergenthal, how he's arrested in 1939 with his family. He spends time in a ghetto in Kielce, Poland, and then he's in, he is sent to a work camp, and then he's sent to another work camp. And then the summer of 1944, he's sent to Auschwitz, 
where he's separated from his mother and father. In January of 1945, he takes part in what is known to history as the Auschwitz Death March, and he is sent to a camp called Sachsenhausen. Many other prisoners, of course, are sent to all other, many different camps, but he ends up in Sachsenhausen. That trip from Auschwitz to Sachsenhausen was almost two weeks in duration. He marched for three days to a railhead and then spent 10 more days on an open cattle car. Now, this is in January, of course, in Central Europe, bitter, bitter cold. So when he arrives in Sachsenhausen, his feet are both badly injured with frostbite. He's got such bad frostbite, his feet have essentially turned black. The skin on his toes are starting to rot and fall off. So he goes to the infirmary, even though he knows being in the infirmary is often one of the most dangerous places you could be because that's where the SS would go looking for their next victims for their selection. He is examined, in fact, interestingly, by a Norwegian doctor who is a prisoner there. And this doctor immediately sees his problem, puts him on an operating table, gives him some ether. When he awakes in a hospital bed in the infirmary, Tom is told by the hospital orderlies that the doctor had to amputate several of his toes in order to save his feet. And Tom undoubtedly was thinking, well, what happens now to me in this condition? What happens if a Nazi doctor walks in and sees a 10-year-old boy lying in a hospital bed using up a bed that I know another working prisoner could be using? What happens if they evacuate Sachsenhausen like they just evacuated Auschwitz? This kid can't walk and won't be able to walk for several weeks, if not months, while he's healing. And the Germans generally did not leave prisoners behind in these camps alive if they could help it. When along walks into this infirmary, Norwegian named Odd Nansen. And Nansen happened to be going into the infirmary for no other reason than to visit a fellow Norwegian friend of his who was sick and happened to be in the same infirmary building. There's actually four different infirmaries in Sachsenhausen. So it was just a miracle that they both were in what was called Revier Number 3, and Nansen, as he writes in his diary, says, when I saw this young boy, my heart just went out to him. Even though he didn't know him, he wasn't even Norwegian, he just felt something for this young boy who was friendless, he was parentless, he was obviously very injured, you know, very helpless. And from that day forward, Nansen used his food and tobacco rations, which as a Norwegian, he was allowed to receive extra rations from the Red Cross. That was one of the perks that the Germans allowed to the Norwegians and the Danes because they considered them part of the Nordic race, which was close to being an Aryan, not quite an Aryan. Kind of wayward Nazis. Exactly. Kind of first cousins, wayward first cousins. Right. Yeah. So Nansen had the wherewithal to be able to use food and tobacco that he had access to, to bribe the orderlies in that hospital ward to make sure that this young Tommy was never put on a selection list. In fact, that meant the difference between probably his demise and his, in fact, ultimate survival. And in the year 2010, Tom Bergenthal, now in his mid-70s, wrote and published this memoir. I read it. I've learned all the story I've just related to you. And then at that point in the story, Bergenthal just has a, a short paragraph that says something to the effect of, this fellow uh, Nansen, who I've been talking to you about, relating the story of how I met him and how he saved my life, by the way, he kept a diary while he was incarcerated. Bergenthal then adds a footnote to the book and gives the specifics of this diary. It was first published in Norway under this title, then translated into English and published in the United States in 1949 under the title From Day to Day. And again, I'm nothing more than a whim again, and probably somewhat interested now in reading somebody else's version of maybe some of the same events from a different perspective, I decided to see if I could find a copy of this diary and read that. I thought it would be as equally interesting. It's 1949 when Odd publishes his diary, but as people will tell you with any book or any film or any project, even asking that girl in high school for a date, anything you do in life is timing, right? Yeah. So this 1949, that's just as the Allies are putting the war behind them. They're unifying West Germany, trying to put it into the war against the Soviet Union. 
They're launching the Berlin airlift. So, you know, this kind of thing is starting to happen. And we've just been at war with Eurasia kind of thing, like in 1984. They're just switching. Now the Germans are our allies. Mm -hmm. Let's kind of forget about the war. We've talked about this a lot in our other Holocaust-related books. Mm -hmm. The diary gains great acclaim at the time, but then it goes out of print for 65 full years. And to illustrate how this work slipped through the cracks of history, I want you to describe to listeners just how you managed to get your hands on one. What did it take? You read about it here in A Lucky Child, and you probably figured it would be pretty easy to find a copy, but that's not the case. Exactly, exactly. Yes, just to back, backtrack just a little bit, it was published in Norway in 1947, shortly after the war. It was a bestseller in Norway. In fact, I think it was the number one bestseller in Norway, which undoubtedly caught someone's interest at uh, G.P. Putnam, the um, publisher in uh, the United States. They, in turn, hire a translator. It's translated into both English and German and published in 1949. And as you point out, Dean, the reviews that were written about the book when it was first issued in English in 1949 were just spectacular. The New York Times, Times Book Review, The New Yorker, The Herald Tribune, everybody says, this is one of the best books to have come, been written about World War II. It's just incredibly well written. It's dynamic. This person is such an interesting person, such a humanitarian. And having gotten to the point in Bergenthal's book where I see the citation, I figure, okay, well, I'll just go on the internet. Everything in the world is available for sale somewhere on the internet. This can't be that difficult. And being the reader that I am, I often lo- I'm looking for books that have long since gone out of print. And it's very easy to find copies. I had no hesitation that I would be able to put my hands on a copy quite quickly. So you can imagine my surprise when after searching every database and every service that deals with old and out-of-print books, I was able to locate one copy of this book from day to day in English available for sale in the United States. It was a bookseller in the state of Washington. And there were Two more booksellers in Great Britain who had a book for sale, one copy for sale with a bookseller in New Zealand, and one in Australia, five in the entire world, which is just an astounding fact when you consider you can probably get more copies of Shakespeare's first folio available on the internet. But in any event, I, being something of a book snob, since I read lots of books and I consider myself a book collector as well, It turned out that the bookseller in New Zealand was the one who had the book that seemed to be in the best condition. So I ordered it from that bookseller, and coming surface mail from New Zealand meant it was going to be many, many, many weeks before it actually arrived on my doorstep. But it ultimately did, and initially, when it arrived, again, the only thing I knew about Odd Nonsen at that point was what I had read about in Tom Bergenthal's book. I hadn't done any independent research on him. The name meant nothing to me. I knew almost nothing, next to nothing, about Norway's experience during World War II. So it wasn't as though I was super eager to read this or came with any preconceptions about how good or how bad it was going to be. I just simply, it was just simply another interesting book dealing with World War II, not a memoir now, but a diary. And, And I was a little bit worried because diaries can sometimes be somewhat repetitious. The the person who's writing it isn't writing it with the luxury of hindsight. They're simply recording what happens to them day after day after day after day. And the other reason I was a little bit hesitant to dive into it, it was a big book, it was like 500 pages, was I was already in the middle of reading some other history book that was fascinating me. So I thought, well, the way to kind of cut this Gordian knot is before I pick up the book I really want to read each night uh, before I go to bed, I will just read one diary entry from Nonsense Book, and I I felt I was going to be putting myself in his shoes and reading it as he was writing it, and that worked for about a week, and then I decided, well, this is going to take me a long, long, long time to finish this book. It's He's going to be in prison for three and a half years. I mean, this is a three and a half year project at the rate I'm going, so why don't I just go to two diary entries per night and, and kind of cut my reading time in half? Did that for another week. Then I said one time I'd read two diary entries and something was about to happen. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was like, gosh, I don't want to put the book down. I want to find out now what's going to happen to him tomorrow. So I went to three diary entries, and from there I was just hooked. I was reading it 
at the breakfast table, instead of looking at my iPhone in the car, you know, at a stoplight, like everybody else does, I was looking at the book. I stopped going out to lunch at work. I was reading it at my lunch hour. I was just utterly smitten by this book at that point. And that's when I made the decision to try to get this book back into print. And you did need that English language version, by the way. You don't read or speak Norwegian, right? Not at that point. Although, interestingly enough, given how much time I have now spent poring over either Norwegian sources or the original Norwegian text, because many times I wanted to go back to the original Norwegian to make sure I understood exactly what the translation was getting at, I can somewhat read Norwegian. I'll never be able to speak it, nor will I ever be able to understand anybody who's speaking it to me. But I can I can parse at least simple sentences with a limited vocabulary at this point. Well, that comes in handy. Although, if you do visit Norway, I don't want this to become a tourism commercial, but they do speak English. That's Perfectly. the second language in the schools, and they're very excited to have anybody to be able to speak English with, kind of practice it. And that's also a legacy of the war. Before the war, it would have been German that they learned. Yes. It's very similar structure, yep. the language, yep. like uh, with the verbs at the end, this kind of thing. And so after the war, things like listening to the BBC – and because they listen to the BBC, sometimes you'll meet people over there and they have the British accent, which can kind of throw you for a second. But they are real Norwegians. They just speak English very well. They, they certainly do. And I've been there now many times, visited it numerous times in the course of my research for this book. And if anybody asked me something in Norwegian, I would, all I have to say is, excuse me. And they instantly knew that I was an English speaker and they flip completely into English. Interestingly, I was, one time went into a bookstore to buy a book and went to the counter and a young girl asked me a question in Norwegian and I said, excuse me. And what she was asking me was, did I want a bag for the book? But when she switched into English, she switched into English with the most interesting Southern accent I had ever heard in my <laughs> life. And I, I did a double take. I asked her, where did you learn English? She said, well, I spent a, a, my junior year abroad at the University of Alabama. Ah, so oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really was kind of a mind-bending experience. Though. Yeah. <laughs> the only Norwegian out there screaming Roll Tide at the TV set, exactly, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I want to get into how he's writing this book. We did start off a little bit light here, which is befitting, you know, the fact that this is about life. It's a man's struggle against death to mm -hmm. keep his humanity in this darkness. Yep. It is always a challenge, though, to share these stories about the Holocaust, as we do in From Day to Day. The Nazi Hunters, when I spoke to Andrew Nagorski about that book, mm -hmm. or The Pharmacist of Auschwitz with Patricia Posner, it's hard. You have to really try to balance it because you'll lose the reader, and then that loses the point of you going through and editing the book. So I wondered if, as you edited Odd Nonsen's book, and he's confronting this Kafkaesque absurdity of the guards— Things like they'll deliver empty envelopes, mm -hmm. as an example. Did you, when you got to those points, sort of highlight those and say, you know, for a modern reader that's so far removed from the war, maybe some of those moments will help get people through the darker moments of Odd Nonsen's experience? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I actually never thought of it quite that way, Dean, to tell you the truth. But I was struck both in my initial reading and then as I've now read it many, many times as I kept drilling down further and further to, to learn more about what every single diary entry meant, what every phrase he was talking about, what these people he was mentioning, etc. I was struck by the fact that he certainly had a very wicked sense of humor, a very highly developed sense of irony. And I think that was a defense mechanism. There's no question in my mind that that helped him to cope with what was going on and you know as you mentioned the kind of kafka-esque rules that are being imposed constantly and i think he tries to distance himself from that and turn it on its head and describe and sometimes it's a caricature of what some of these nazi guards are um, the one point they're complaining i think one of the norwegian doctors in Gnini is complaining to a german guard that the food rations are just too darn small for especially these young Norwegians, prisoners who are doing manual labor for 12, 14, 16 hours a day. They can't subsist on the amount of food that they're getting. The doctor says, you know, I've done an examination of the food that's being doled out, 
and the amount of calories are just insufficient, to which the German guards sniffs and says, well, I have never had my calories examined. So a sense of both the absurd and, and the humorous, and I think there was no question that Nansen relied on that to keep his mental stability, at least for as long as possible. I did notice, and I think I point out in my introduction, the number of times that he laughs or talks about laughing diminishes throughout the entire course of his incarceration. And I think for the latter 18 months when he's in Sachsenhausen, there was only one incident, and that was, I think, on his birthday, where some of his friends were kind of hamming it up and trying to imitate being in a fancy restaurant when they're serving him essentially kind of cabbage soup and, and other you know, really low fare. So I didn't highlight it because it's all there. And I certainly mention it in my introduction and call attention to that, that it's worth being mindful of. And I think as strange as it sounds, I think that's an important part of what his personality was. So yes, there was some humor I mean, he relied on it extensively in the course of his incarceration and writes about it in his diary. My guest is Tim Boyce, editor of From Day to Day, One Man's Diary of Survival in Nazi Concentration Camps. Pay him a visit at Tim Boyce, that's B-O-Y-C-E, timboyce.com. Orville Prescott of the New York Times says of From Day to Day, quote, writing with no thought of publication, merely to keep a record for his wife and to express his own boiling emotions, Mr. Nonsen somehow created a remarkable book. Using stolen paper and stolen time, always in fear of being caught, he described each day's adventures with stark simplicity and intimate authority, unquote. Tim, I want to focus on that idea of odd writing, not for publication, but for his family and to keep his sanity. We've talked a little bit about how he's losing his sanity or becoming unhinged or being weighed down by all this pressure. Mm -hmm. So how does he do this and how does he safeguard these pages and get them out of the concentration camps? Well, that's a fascinating story in and of itself. It's worth pointing out that Nansen was an inveterate diarist almost his entire life. I think he started writing a diary when he was a teenager. His father had been a diarist on his polar exploration. So it was kind of in his DNA to do this. And he mentions that the night he was arrested in 1942, the last things he put into his backpack were some paper and some pencils. So he knew right from the get-go that he was going to keep doing this, both, as you mentioned, as a kind of a psychological tool for himself to process this information. In fact, he talks about the diary as being his private manner of forgetting, and also as a record for his wife, Kari, in particular. For the first half of his incarceration, roughly 18 months or so, Nansen was kept primarily in a concentration camp just outside of Oslo called Grini. And while he was in Norway, it was actually quite easy for him to... Uh, both hide the diary, he says he would put it in the place where the Germans would never look, which was primarily he'd keep it hidden somewhere in the privy. They obviously didn't spend a lot of time walking around in there. And then in terms of smuggling it out, it was somewhat easy, as I mentioned sometimes when I make some presentations about the book. The Ganini camp, at least, was very porous in the sense of people were constantly coming in and, and going out of the camp. When you think about the fact that at its height, uh, Ganini Prison probably housed about 9,000 prisoners. And in those days, they didn't have frozen foods, freeze-dried foods, uh, large packaged foods. Pretty much everything had to be brought in almost every single day. So who's supplying all of this food? It's other Norwegians, Norwegian civilians. Who's bringing in all the construction materials as they continue to build more and more and more barracks? It's Norwegian civilians. Who's coming in to do repairs on the plumbing and the electricity? Norwegian civilians. So these are all people who are sympathetic to the plight of their fellow countrymen who are the prisoners at Ganini. So Nansen was able to work out a fairly elaborate system of smuggling diary entries every couple of days out, sometimes slipping it into uh, the pocket of a friend. Sometimes he'd roll up a page very small and actually put it into a cigarette. And the workers coming in would know enough to ask, hey, can I borrow a cigarette from you? And he would hand them one and they'd put it in their pocket and 
Of course, Dot lighted it up. They'd walk out of the camp with it and deliver all this to Nansen's wife, Kari, who would then hide it for the duration of the war. So that's how Nansen was able to essentially get through the first half of his incarceration. I wouldn't say fairly easily, but he did have a system for smuggling the, the diary out, and he had good connections, and he was able to do it. When he gets transferred to Sachsenhausen inside of Germany in uh, late 1943, he realizes there's no one here who is sympathetic to me at all who's going to help me. And he writes about the fact that I don't know what I'm going to do with the diary, quite frankly. He realizes that every prisoner who leaves the camp and every prisoner who comes into the camp is always thoroughly searched because the Germans are looking for contraband. So he realizes I'm not going to be able to like, somehow walk out of this camp with a 200-page manuscript somehow hidden under my shirt and without being caught. But psychologically, the diary had become so important to him that he writes, I just have to keep writing this and hoping that I'll find some solution to this intractable problem that I'm facing. And even if at the end I can't think of any any way to get this out of the camp, then at, at the very end I'll just bury this in the ground and it'll still have served its purpose. And interestingly enough, diaries have been found buried in the ground at various concentration camps, primarily in Auschwitz. A number of diaries have been found over the years hidden in different places, mostly written by Jewish members of the Sonderkommando. So he wasn't the only person who had these thoughts. At one point, he must have had a brainstorm or somebody had suggested to him the fact that even though every prisoner walks in and out of the camp is always being searched, every prisoner always carries with them two items, two personal items. In fact, the only two personal items a prisoner is pretty much allowed to have, one of which is a tin cup. You need, you need a cup to be able to drink water or get your ration of cabbage soup or to get your ersatz coffee. And the other item you have is what was called a breadboard, a simple piece of wood that measured you know, roughly five by nine inches. And this is what a prisoner would line up in the morning in their barracks and get their bread ration doled out to them, whether that was half a loaf or three quarters of a loaf or whatever it was. And they would essentially use it as their plate, their table, they would eat some of the bread in the morning, maybe they'd save some of it in the afternoon and then eat it at lunch, whatever. And Nansen had the brainstorm that he could actually take his breadboard and slice it, not crossways, but lengthwise through the narrow width of the board, hollow out the inside of it, and then put the two pieces of breadboard together, almost like two leaves of a book, and in that way secrete out the diary at the end of the war, because of course he was writing at this point very tiny, tiny entries, very small handwriting on his entries, and he was using tissue thin paper. So he could he could actually carry quite a bit inside of a thin breadboard. And of course he had other Norwegian friends, five other ones in fact, who also agreed to do this with their breadboards. And at the end of the war, Nansen took all of these pages that he had been writing in the the Sachsenhausen portion of the diary is much shorter than the Ganini portion of the diary, the Norwegian portion of the diary, for that very reason. But at the end of the war, they walked out of the camp with all their breadboards. No one asked them anything about their breadboards. And of course, then when they got back to Norway, ultimately split them open and took out the pages, and that comprised the German portion of the diary. So an ingenious solution to what for a while there seemed like an insoluble problem that he had. Those breadboards you said there's four or five of them he uses, are those in a museum today? What's the fate of those breadboards? Well, they're in various places, interestingly enough. Nansen's breadboard being the most famous, since he was the owner, of the writer of the diary, that is now in, in a prominent display inside the Norwegian Resistance Museum, which is their World War II museum in Oslo. So I've seen it behind the glass some of the other breadboards are still in private ownership, believe it or not. They're not all belonging to the museum. So I've been able to see one up close uh, in person, one of the ones that was used. It's amazing that something as small and as simple as that could be used to get this right underneath the noses of the German guards without anybody suspecting anything about it. Um, and interestingly, I received an email that initially went to Tom Bergenthal, 
from a woman who lives in northern Norway, Tromso. You would be familiar with the location of that. It's pretty far north. And she was writing to Tom Bergenthal, stating that her father had been a prisoner in Sachsenhausen. He had died a few years ago. And unfortunately, while he was alive, never talked about his experiences at Sachsenhausen at all, never shared anything with his children. And this daughter was writing to Tom Bergenthal, wondering if Tom might remember her father and might be able to shed any light on anything about his experiences there. Tom, unfortunately, did not have any recollection of this gentleman, but passed on that email to me and mentioned that maybe I could help, based on my research, pass along some information. It turns out this woman's father was the carpenter who actually split the breadboards wow. for these Norwegians. Of all the people in Norway to be connected to, it's just absolutely fascinating to me that I got to know, or have now corresponded via email, with this woman whose father was the joiner, the carpenter in the shop, who did the actual cutting and uh, hollowing out of these breadboards for Nansen and his friends. Another one of those moments of just an incredible connection yes. that fills in the story. Unbelievable serendipity. Yep. And it happens yeah. over and over and over again. Yep. That's the amazing thing. And by the way, that Resistance Museum have been there too. <laughs> Sound like a, an ad here for tourism because it is a great place to go to go to Norway if you love World War II history. Yes. So, or even if you love the outdoor stuff, all that, the forests, people are great. So, heck, I'm just going to go all in. I, I love to go to Norway. <laughs> I would second so, that. Great, great country to visit. Back then, we talked a little bit about being occupied by the Nazis. And Odd Nansen is appalled by some of his fellow Norwegians getting seduced by these anti-Semitic attitudes that they're picking up from the fascist party and from the influence of the occupation. Mm -hmm. We discussed that occupation with Neil Bascom, author of The Winter Fortress, about the heavy water plant in Norway up in Telemark, where, yes, I have also been. So leave me alone, everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but That I have not, so I, I have that on my list. <laughs> oh, very, very cool. I mean, when you think of those guys climbing up that cliff, the mm. Germans don't even bother to guard it because they figure, well, nobody could possibly get up there. They didn't bank on these Norwegian winter footing of these yep. guys and their boldness to do that. That's yep. incredible. And also, by the way, they do it without killing anybody because they know, as we discussed earlier, they're going to take that out on the populace of Norway. They're going to kill a bunch of civilians. So mm -hmm. go scale this sheer wall in the dark. Get in there, set your charges, blow it up, and don't kill anybody. It's just an yes. incredible, incredible story. So yes, yes. the Winter Fortress really also made me very excited to read Odd's view here of the occupation and the resistance fighters like those who scuttled Hitler's dreams of mushroom clouds over London and New York. So talk a little bit about what's happening in Norway and his view of the resistance. He desperately wants to help, wants to free Norway, but he can't do that when he's in a concentration camp the whole war. Correct, correct. Well, Nansen was a member of the resistance, kind of broadly defined, before he was arrested as a hostage, as you mentioned. He, at this point, when the Germans occupied Norway in April of 1940, he was 39 years old, he had a family, so he wasn't one of these young hotheads who was out trying to blow up railroad bridges and things like that, but he was a senior person, well-respected, and was clearly involved in the resistance more in terms of trying to set policy and inform the Norwegian government in exile as to what was going on and try to get direction from them. But it's clear, yes, he is a prisoner, as you say, so he can't do very much inside of the various camps that he was in. But his attitude is so clear from the very get-go that he will resist with every fiber of his body. I mean, he never gives any slack to his German captors. He essentially, he's one of these people who's kind of like the squeaky wheel. He constantly talks back, constantly tells the Germans they're going to lose the war ultimately, which they don't want to hear. Uh, he <laughs> engages in conversations or debates with anybody who wants to take him on to make it clear that he has no sympathy for the Germans. I think one time one German says, well, how are you going to feel about us after the war? And he said, based on what you folks have done, we have no option but essentially to you know, try to hold you accountable. You're at fault here, and we're going to remember this. So at least thought, word, and deed, I think, even as a prisoner, he's one of the 
the recalcitrant prisoners who never gives an inch. And I think there's a great scene where he's once being questioned by the head of the Gestapo, who essentially is trying to almost incriminate him by getting him to admit something, I think as another reason for them to be able to either keep him in prison longer or ultimately send him to Germany. And he knows or he senses that if he gives maybe the right answers, i.e. the answers that Germans want to hear, this might help his chances of getting a release from prison. He writes in the diary at least that, you know, as a matter of conscience, I could not hold back and not say what was on my mind, even if that meant that my chances of release were going to be destroyed by virtue of what I was saying. And then he goes even further, which to me is just an an astounding description. I've, I've never heard anybody kind of describe it this way. But he says this Gestapo person who obviously didn't get to where he was without being very clever, he says he would ask his questions in such a cunning way that even silence was a form of treason, and on no account would I give in to that. So he thought even keeping his mouth shut was in some way tacitly agreeing to what this person was saying, so he would refuse to do that and would just give it right back to him. And as we know, he spent, and as we mentioned before, he spent the entire duration in the war. I think that was, it was more important to him to live according to his principles and his conscience than it was even to get out and be reunited with his family, no matter how much he desperately wanted to be with them. So he was the ultimate model, in in my mind, of a resistance fighter. The toughness reminded me throughout this book and the Winter Fortress and going through that resistance museum of uh, something Stephen Van Zandt's character says. He's in the Witness Protection Program in Lillehammer, the Netflix series, Mm -hmm. and another mafia guy's kind of trying to muscle in on his territory and says, oh, living among these Scandinavians has made you soft and weak. And Stephen Van Zandt says the fjords are full of bodies of those who mistook the Norwegians for soft and weak. And... I thought over and over, not just physical strength here, not just being able to endure months and months and months of just cabbage soup, which is it does nothing for you. A little bit of bread does nothing for you. But the emotional and mental and strength of commitment to the cause of seeing Norway be free. And you have such passion for this story. I have passion for this story. We're not Norwegian. And I look at Odd Nansen and I say, well, he wasn't Jewish, and yet he risked his life to help Tommy. Mm-hmm. He risked his life to get this word out. He risked his life to talk back to the Germans. I mean, if he's arguing with a German soldier, it may seem silly. It may seem pointless. But that's a moment maybe that SS officer isn't off hassling some Jewish person or killing somebody or catching somebody else who's trying to do a little resistance and trying to yep. get away and maybe sneak some food to somebody that's being held in solitary confinement. So it really does matter when you're talking about being inside a concentration camp. And I wanted to give you a chance to make your pitch here to 21st century readers who maybe also have no connection to the war, no connection to Norway or the Holocaust. Why should they pick up from day to day? What will they get out of it to be better people, to feel this passion you and I feel? Well, I think, Dean, that like all great literature, this story transcends its time and place. People read the Iliad, which is describing a a war that occurred 4,000 years ago, but we're still reading the Iliad. It's still a classic. We still read All Quiet on the Western Front, even though World War I has been over for 100 years. We read The Red Badge of Courage because it's a great piece of literature, even though Civil War is now 150 years in the past. I think fundamentally... Yes, this is a World War II concentration camp diary, but more than that, it's just a human interest story incredibly eloquently told about how one person somehow manages to keep his humanity in the most inhumane conditions imaginable. In fact, we really can't imagine, and and Nansen himself struggles with saying, no matter what I say, I will never be able to convey to you what really went on inside these camps because human imagination essentially falls short. And yet here he is standing up for his principles, as we've mentioned. And I think that's the inspirational value of this. I don't think it's you're simply reading this to learn 
what happened on a day-to-day basis in a concentration camp. Uh, I think you're you eat very, very quickly, as happened to me when I first started this, reading you know, one diary entry, then two diary entries. You just get swamped up and learn, and you become an observer to somebody acting incredibly uh, humanely in a way, and, and we're always being tested ourselves and in any situation to say what is the right thing to do and should we be doing that and not worrying about the consequences. And I think that's his example of constantly doing what he thought was right and, you know, the kind of the consequences be damned. If that meant he spent time in uh, the rest of the war in a concentration camp and didn't get back to his family, well, that's what he was going to do. And I think to the extent you don't know much about the war, and I don't think you need to know much, you now have the benefit of the annotations that I've added to this book, which I think exceed, I've never counted them all, but I think they're well over 500. So if you want to know more about who these people are, who the events are, what the Battle of Stalingrad is, what Operation Torch means, what D-Day, which of course we all know in America, what that's all about, I've added annotations to allow you to learn about World War II and drill down a little bit more in detail. But I think, again, it's this is, to me, the ultimate benefit of this is the inspirational example of Odd Nansen. And it just so happens that the reason why it's so spectacular or so interesting is it happens within the crucible of a concentration camp set in World War II. One final piece of housekeeping, speaking of doing the right thing and doing for others, most authors write a book, they work on it with at least some thought of their bottom line, if not dreams of landing on the bestseller list, but you're not making a penny off of from day to day. When people buy it and you make a profit and make some royalties, where does that money go and why? Well, Dean, I I still am hoping to land on the bestseller list. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. I'm hoping you do too. Well, thank you. Um, (laughs) Well, I think it is obvious. I fell in love with this book, and I decided it just had to be reprinted. So my motivation from the get-go was not this is a money-making venture. More it was I just want to share the word. I want to share this story so that people read and experience what I've read and experienced. And profit is really not even a secondary or a tertiary motive. It doesn't even take part of the equation. And further, as I started to do research, Dean, on Odd Nansen and his background, his family, which I've now incorporated into a fairly lengthy introduction to this new edition of the book. I learned that when Odd Nansen's father, Pritoff Nansen, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1922, he received, as do people who receive the Nobel Peace Prize today, a very sizable cash stipend. Nowadays, I think it ex- exceeds a million dollars. I'm not sure exactly what it was back in 1922. But Fritjof Nansen gave that money away to refugee agencies in the 1920s. When Odd Nansen published his book, and it was then translated, as we discussed, in 1949 into both English and into German, Odd Nansen gave the royalties for the German translation to German refugees. Now, here is somebody who has been brutalized by the Germans for almost 40 months, and at one point despaired that he would ever get out of these camps alive. And yet here he is saying, these German refugees need this help, and we must give it to them. And here he is giving away his own royalties. So almost from the very, very, very beginning, in fact, the first meeting that I had when I started this project was I went up to Washington, D.C. from Charlotte, which is where I was living at the time, and I met with Thomas Bergenthal because I really wanted to both meet him and talk to him about his book, but also get his imprimatur, so to speak, on this project that I was about to undertake. Of course, Tom was completely supportive of the idea, and I mentioned to him that if I could ever find a publisher, that I would dedicate all of my royalties to a charity or charities that I thought Nansen would have approved of if he were still around. And when we finally did find a a publisher in in 2014, Vanderbilt University Press, I consulted with Nansen's children, primarily with his eldest daughter, Marit, who is now 88 years old, has been 
a great inspiration in this project. She has a fantastic memory. Going back to one of your earlier questions, she was 14 years old the night her father was arrested. So she has a, almost a perfectly clear picture and memory of what that night was like and was able to relate all that story about hiding the radio, et cetera. And after discussing this with her and, and telling her that I was going to give these royalties away, I wanted to hear her views in terms of what she thought her father would approve of. We ultimately kind of decided that we would split them and 50% of my royalties would go to the U.S. Memorial Holocaust Museum in D.C. and 50% of them would go to the Jewish Museum in Oslo, which I have visited several times. And I have actually just recently received my first royalty check. So I am anxious to turn around and redistribute it to those two very worthy organizations. And I'm happy to do it. That's the least of my interest in this. To me, getting people interested in reading the book and getting feedback through my website from people who have read it, meeting people at author talks and presentations is all the psychic reward I'll ever need. Well, Tim Boyce, editor of From Day to Day in Norwegian, thank you is talk and a thousand thanks is Tusen talk. Yep. So I say Tusen talk to you to express great appreciation for you joining me today and for reaching back into history to share Odd Nonsense's striking diary with us from inside those concentration camp walls. Best of luck with the book, and Thank please you. keep us all posted on the progress. Terrific, terrific. Well, I say Tucson Talk back to you, and thank you so much for having me on your show. It's been a delight on my end, and I, I love talking about this story. Thank you. Across the Skagerrak to Oslo came the first British officers to receive the surrender of those Germans still in Norway. Obes Kasch of the Wehrmacht meets British Air Commodore Darrow. The RAF meet old comrades, members of Norway's underground army. And the citizens of Oslo, as those of every other liberated country, went mad with joy to be rid at last of the German invader. Norwegian flags reappeared from every window. Until late into the night, the people danced and celebrated in the streets. The pent-up emotions of five years now break their bounds. Norway again belongs to Norway. Norway is free. Again, the book is From Day to Day, One Man's Diary of Survival in Nazi Concentration Camps. As always, you can find that Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com. We hope you will click through there because Amazon gives us a small percentage of every purchase you make at no additional cost to you. And in the spirit of Tim's generosity, we're going to donate all the dollars or kroner to use the Norwegian currency to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and the Jewish Museum of Oslo. Once again, my sincere and overflowing thanks to Tim Boyce for joining us and for bringing Odd Nonsense's story to life. It's really scary to think that if he doesn't pick up that book in that bookstore on that day, we may never have heard about Odd Nonsense at all. How long would it have been before those five English copies just disappeared? It's truly a story of serendipity, and it connects all of us back to this incredible man. Pay Tim a visit at timboyce.com. That last name is B-O-Y-C-E. Pay Tim a visit at timboyce.com. And while you're at it, let us know what you think of Odd Nonsense Journey and the interview on Twitter at History Dean or Facebook.com slash History Author. That's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for next Monday's all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio or wherever you're listening. And if you subscribe to us on iTunes, please take a minute to leave us a review. Until our next trip into the past together, Thanks so much for time traveling with us today, and have a great week. The boys won the war and came home from the fight. The last night on Broadway was almost as nice. 
But ever since then, it's a different street. Gone are the places where the gang used to be. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.